everybody and welcome to this second Cheryl conference. Um, it's lovely to see so many people, although I have to say we did expect, well we have signed up more, more people than I appear to see out in this audience. Nevertheless, um, I think there could be people coming as we're speaking as well because people are trying to fit in their teaching. Uh, we still quite a lot of people having coffee. No one's really kind of pushing people through yet. So. Oh, right. So this is. Okay, thank you. Okay, fine. Fine. Which is really difficult when you are the chair of the conference and you're also then responsible for the timekeeping, and I think already I'm failing. <laughs> Never the met. Nevertheless, I might be failing at this conference timing, but I can assure you, Manchester is tough ready and that's why we'll be pressed tomorrow. Right, we've got everybody through now, I think just about. If you could just quite take... Oh, uh, there's sorry, quite a few coming in behind me. Oh, this, this is looking more like... The, this is looking much more like it. I thought, how could we have well over 100 people? Um, in, in fact, approaching 150 signed up for this conference. And yet I looked around the room and there were so many chairs empty. Right, please do take a seat as quickly as you can. Once again, do not be frightened to sit at the front. Well done, thank you very much. Right, just to remind everybody, um, it's now coming in because, because sorry I didn't start at 9.30, but never mind. Whoa, there are plenty more people coming in. There are seats at the front. Right, a big welcome to everybody for this second Cheryl Dissemination Conference. I think it's really, really timely in terms of the feedback from the conference last year when we must have been flagging up the notion of TEF. A lot of the feedback was around don't really understand what TEF's about. Hopefully everybody in this room understands a lot better what TEF is about now because your submission will go in tomorrow, that button will be pressed. Um, but meanwhile, the government is in the process of determining TEF 3. So there'll be a little bit uh, more about that and all. Um, I think in terms of thinking about TEF Ready, I think it's really important as well to look at the really, really important role of Cheryl in the whole TEF landscape. In terms of the University of Manchester being able to demonstrate its commitment to that continuous improvement, that evolution of pedagogic approaches across the whole of the university, but also within the individual disciplines. So in terms of those approaching 50 projects that Cheryl has now financed, and also done the impact studies on the, the, the first round, it's, in, it's provided some important evidence that has been able to be fed into the TEF narrative, and Clive will be able to say more about that to a certain extent. But of course today, you will be able to listen to the presentations from all of the projects, which was something that was asked for last year as well, to think how might that actually influence what I might wish to do within my own discipline area, or across the university, or whatever. So that's, that's the overview. You've got the programme in front of you. But then when I was thinking in terms of introducing the day, I thought it also could be useful to just have a quick canter through a few things to just get you thinking big picture before I pass over to Clive to give you the University of Manchester perspective. So in terms of thinking about teaching and learning in higher education and are we tech ready, <coughs> um, I think it's really important then to understand the importance of bringing about teaching excellence. Why suddenly are we concerned about teaching excellence? Not just because it was a whim of the Conservative government that they threw into their manifesto. You know, there are underpinning, um, underpinning commitments that go back many decades, right back to the Humboldtian notion, of course, of, of teaching and learning. Um, let's look at an international perspective, because it isn't just the UK now that's thinking this will be a good idea. It is global, and it's global big time, and there's been some big investment globally as well. Understanding TEF2, there might be people in this room that say, I understand TEF2 really well, really get it, I've really contributed a lot. But then I think in terms of, great, then let's think about how that feeds into TEF3, and then look at how the work of Cheryl can assist in that narrative, because it's a story around the metrics, that I'm sure you're well aware of the metrics, but it's what does the story that Manchester has to tell 
which is a really great story about you know kind of the roots of a commitment to teaching and learning, a commu commitment to, to widening participation, etc. <coughs> So, in terms of thinking about the dimensions of teaching excellence, yesterday I chaired um, an HEA Happy Breakfast seminar that was was about the two sides of the coin: teaching and excellence. Uh, sorry, <coughs> teaching and research, and thinking about actually we should be committed to teaching excellence in both. And if you look at the process of what goes on in research, research and look at what goes on in, in teaching, it's that never-ending quest to improve and to push the barriers. So why shouldn't we want to be committed equally to teaching as we are to research? And I think one of the things though that, that we need to bear in mind in thinking about teaching excellence is that difference then between threshold quality, which of course allowed us then to get TEF1, and TEF1 nationally, um, all those institutions that had a, a a sound judgment from the QAA were able to uplift their fees as a result of that but this TEF2 now is really pushing the barriers in terms of what evidence have you got that you're really committed to teaching excellence and what have you done that's new, innovative, creative that's pushing the barriers in terms of that well beyond threshold concepts and I think the preconditions and the evidencing of excellence are something that you'll see with the presentations throughout the day. You'll all be familiar, I hope, with those three areas that, are, that contain the metrics of teaching quality, learning environment, and student outcomes and learning gain. And of course, the narrative had to be written about those. So you'll be well aware then, of course, as we said last year as well, NSS data, um, Delhi data, retention data. But what evidence has been provided from Manchester? And as I say, more and more of that one. So I just want to put it into an international perspective in terms of, of what we're, what coming on globally uh, to include how excellence is assessed because I think that's interesting. In terms of thinking about the international context, social and economic um, drivers are really important across the whole <coughs> world in terms of thinking about social mobility, <coughs> inclusivity and of course some nations still don't have a participation rate even approaching 40% and they're pushing for that and of course thinking about increasing social capital absolutely important as well. In terms of higher level skills, this is a big driver internationally across all the nations that, that you might care to look at in terms of thinking what are employers about saying about <coughs> graduates, what are they saying about uh, people that they want to recruit, they want the higher level skills, they want people with critical an, uh, uh, analysis skills, able to make decisions, able to engage in teamwork, etc. So there's nothing unique to Britain about that. Inclusivity, the big one, how do we actually get that widened participation? Diversifying the offer, I think in the UK now post-Brexit we're thinking about diversifying the offer more than ever before in, in terms of thinking about the whole distance learning piece. But if we're looking at blended learning, now much more distance learning here, but that also is a global phenomenon. And then finally international competitiveness, of course we're concerned about that because particularly once again post-Brexit, the visa regime, uh, We've got issues, have we not, in terms of now overseas student recruitment, we're already we're seeing Canada and Australia benefiting from some of the issues that we have in this country. So looking then at the, the, the US, and uh, I'm just gonna canter through these so you've got a sense of what they've been doing in this space. The big issue in the, in the, the US, but right, going right back to the Spellings Commission was, what are we doing about learning gain? So many of our students are coming out of university, having graduated with huge debt, unable to find a job, a graduate level job, and also they didn't actually learn anything in the process. There was no learning gain. So what are we going to do about it? The NESI, um, and I have to say we our, our keynote speaker today has actually worked on, on, on the NESI in Ohio, which is where the, uh, the UK engagement survey originated from, um, then looked at, let's get a sense of what students are engaging with that really makes a difference in terms of learning. And that perhaps is contributing to learning gain. And the other area then that I wanted to just flag up was the Khan Academy, of course, of course, that whole notion of MOOCs and how MOOCs can learn to lead to greater inclusivity and participation. <coughs> Australian, what have, what have they been doing? And it is, isn't as if these are operating in isolation, because of course the key thing is different countries are vying up each other, thinking who's ahead of the game and what's it going to make, mean for them in terms of their own competitive advantage. So in terms of Australia, I think the key thing here was having originally looked at how they could 
seed corn small projects, which of course is what Cheryl's about, how do they take it to the bigger level to then be institutional projects? So once the Office for Learning and Teaching was set up, really big institutional projects were supported. But then with the, the, the flood disaster there, funding got cut there, but now much of the emphasis is on what our institution's doing for a, a learning, learning and teaching and student experience strategy. <coughs> Looking to the Far East, okay, the Far East coming in a bit later, but be prepared to uh, invest a lot more money. Very, very keen to say, okay, target, we've got a 40% participation rate. What, are, what might they, been do, they do, be doing and not doing quite so well in the, in the other side of the globe? And what can we learn and how we can, can we take it forward? So they're already devising their own approaches to teaching excellence, a lot focused uh, are already then on making sure all their staff are qualified to teach but then going to the next level in thinking about what their own TEF might look like. And I think at the moment, the models they're looking to are, are Norway and Germany. So in terms of looking at UK, counter through this, a huge amount of investment, as you'll see over the, year, the years, to include my own institution, the Higher Education Academy, having had a lot of money invested over the years, up until uh, a couple of years ago when the, the money was pulled. But with no kind of national, let's just look at an, a big evaluation what has the impact been on the nation? So the TEF really is the first chance to say that here is a national, an overall national initiative and we will demonstrate the, the impact and we will do it by awarding these three levels of medals as a result of the submissions that they put in to demonstrate how all this money over the years and particularly over the last three has made a difference. So meanwhile then in Germany they decide actually we're going to invest a uh, billions in the whole area of excellence and I guess many of you will be familiar with the research excellence <coughs> model there but then of course they've introduced the teaching excellence model there which has been much more kind of a snowballing approach where institutions put in they put in for big funding and a lot of them is, st is, is starting with smaller initiatives that they are aiming to snowball. I know there was a critique about it in the Times Higher uh, last week but I think once again they're, they're saying let's start small and grow from these seed corn pr approaches. And then Norway, which once again has looked at what's gone on in the UK and said, actually, you've invested millions over the years, but then if you look at the impact of that nationally, it's a bit disparate. Mm -hmm. So let's think about how we support <coughs> one centre for excellence, and then from that we'll evaluate it, and then three years later we'll grow it to three, then we'll grow it to four, and so on and so forth. So a very different sort of approach there, kind of learning from what, what's worked. Then if you look at a comparison about what's gone on then globally in terms of their investment in teaching excellence. The thing I find fascinating is we're the only country that expects students to pay for all this because of course that's coming back via if you're graded more highly you're able to increase your fees and you'll know that, that the, the Lords thankfully is, is doing a big pushback on that to what extent they'll be successful is another matter. But I think it's, it, it is interesting looking at the different approaches, and I won't go on about that um, for too long, because I really want to be able to focus down on how we're going about this in the UK. So, which brings <coughs> us then to TEF2. So, TEF2, as I said before, the, submission, um, the submissions from all the institutions <coughs> go in tomorrow. You'll be aware as well that the majority in Scotland aren't actually um, putting in now after Edinburgh made public declarations that they weren't. But of course they haven't got the link to funding. <coughs> so that's something major in terms of, you know, if you're hoping to put up your tuition fees, it's hugely risky to, to not participate in this. Um, results out in May and then the, the thing that will be interesting is over the summer, I think, the HEI are going to be doing a, 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 a data uh, delving exercise to look at what can we learn from all these narratives. Are there new initiatives that we might want to think about? Are there different metrics in there that can help us to be able to persuade the government to move away from NSS, for example, or Delhi, which are, uh, that is already uh, underway. So, year one, year two, year three, year four, you can see they've got it all mapped out. So it isn't as if there's going to be a pause button. Like other countries, there isn't going to be a chance to say, let's conduct a full evaluation before we then determine how we're moving forward. While we speak, <coughs> TEF 3 is already being considered, as is TEF 4. <coughs> TEF 4 being the one that's introducing the po postgraduate level uh, a, a narrative as well, whereas year three are the subject pilots. Um, you'll be aware then of 
Uh, some of these core and split metrics, the submission, holistic performance, which Clive will go into in more detail, focusing down on Manchester, and I think that'll make it much more meaningful for you. And then final outcomes, of course, gold, silver, and bronze. Okay, much concern in, in, in the nation as well, but I think the thing we need to bear in mind against this backdrop, there are 152 further education colleges uh, which are also providers of higher education, which have also suggested that they are entering tech. So they're wanting to enter. So they will be part of the mix then that determines where uh, um, different institutions fall in terms of this grading. General projects then assisting the TEF, uh, TEF narrative? Well, I think today will be proof of that when you hear the rich narrative around some of these projects and the impacts that they're already making in this first year of their funding. I think, as I said before, the year one projects are already making a lot of, of, of impact and continue to make impact. Year two, you'll hear about more today. So, um, thank you very much for listening and I'll now pass over to Clive. So I'm just going to show a few slides. Um, Stephanie's very um, usefully given us the international context. I just wanted to show a few slides um, taking us back to the University of Manchester. Um, some of you might have seen this, some of you haven't. This, this is basically the outcome for the TEF uh, that we're currently involved in TEF2 for the core <coughs> metrics for the country. So this is based on the core metrics. None of this data is published, but this was, this was produced by EFKI. And what you can see from that is that 15% of institutions are currently gold. That's not 15% of students, because many of those institutions are very small indeed. So it'll be a much smaller proportion. 23% um, are, are bronze. Now, all this is meant to be um, confidential um, because we're not allowed to influence each of the return. So I can't tell you how um, Manchester's fared in this, but I can tell you that we're not gold and we're not bronze. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've got challenges and we're not a strong silver, which I'll allude to. Um, two things that I think we should be aware of. This is not the end result. Splits. Detailed analysis um, takes us into other areas, but the splits are very much based upon our entry standards. So we're going to hear from Camille Moon about learning gain. Learning gain is already in here, even though it's not explicit in terms of the way in which the metrics have been calculated, learning gain is part of the process. And we've got quite a few areas where we're performing below the sector that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the other thing to mention, I think, beyond learning gain is that um, one thing I would say that I think one of the key agendas we're taking forward is student engagement. Um, it's coming in the new NSS questions, but student engagement seems to me how we measure that, how we do that, is one of the challenges we're going to face as an institution um, over the coming years. So if I can just sort of take a, a stop take quickly in terms of how we're doing. The NSS fell from 86 to 85. You'll all know about that in the room and you'll know some of the reasons for that, but that is where we're getting hurt. Those are the areas in terms of teaching quality, in terms of assessment <coughs> feedback, and in terms of academic support. That's where we're getting a real kicking as an institution compared to the sector. We're doing well on employment. We're doing very well on non-continuation. We're doing well on um, <coughs> recruitment. Although I have to say, I think there are major challenges on the quality of students we're recruiting post-Brexit. So there are going to be challenges ahead that we're going to have to deal with. Also, I would say, in terms of recruitment, even though there are more 18-year-olds sitting A-levels, less 18-year-olds in the sector, the number of students getting A-star A's has not shifted. So we're not getting a greater pool of students getting the higher grades. And everybody's competing for those. So quality is going to be one of the key agendas for us going forward. And we know from our analysis that if we take the quality of student intake down, employability, degree attainment drops with that. So then just to say, basically go <coughs> on to league tables that so Colin, at the end, Colin Bailey say more about, but just look at those first two rows. It is staggering. <coughs> We're 90th in the sector for teaching. This is the Guardian uh, League tables. And experience of 48th in the sector. It is just unacceptable, and everybody in the room will agree with me on that. So what I want to get out of today is what do we need to do to address the poor quality perceived by our students? We have to say it's perceived, but it's a student experience assessment. It's not a quality measure. But the fact that we're 90th really kills us, and it's something we've got to do about seriously. I put some other um, statistics there just for you to peruse on, that uh, employability, both employment and higher skills, uh, are both high and improving dramatically. But I also thought it's nice to know that 50% of our um, graduates in high positive destinations 
uh, stay in the northwest. 20% go to London, and then 6% go to Yorkshire. <laughs> I'll let you make the joke up yourself. <laughs> so last slide then. Um, I think it's, it's worthwhile just reflecting on the things that we should be proud of as an institution that we're already delivering across these key areas. And I see Cheryl as one of those key areas of pedagogic innovation that's telling and informing the university what it should be doing going to the future. Uh, My Learning Essentials has been a great benefit to university um, alongside the Allen Guild Learning Commons, and we need to do more around that. But as you go through this list um, of things that we're doing really well as an institution, and you start looking at which students are actually taking advantage of these, time and again, you will find many of our ethnic minorities and students from lower households are not always taking advantage of the things that we're offering in terms of <coughs> learning quality and in terms of support. And that's why I come back to my, my sort of opening point about engagement. If we can't engage in all students to take advantage of what we're doing, we won't move the university forward. And so I, I think the engagement for me is one of the key challenges. What I also want to get out today is what can we do better across this list? But what should we be doing that's new? I think the TEF submission, um, again, um, the, the President will make an announcement in a weekly message tomorrow about it, but let's assume that I've not been sitting on my backside, I have actually been writing this, this thing um, with Richard and other colleagues. Um, post TEF, I think it's giving us an opportunity to look at our data and our performances that's sector-wide. We've been obsessed with comparing ourselves to the Russell Group. We now have to think about what the sector's doing and how we perform within the sector, and it's not a pretty picture. And I think what I'd like to get out of today are the things that we need to do, particularly around engaging students, where we are seeing um, their experience is not what we'd like it to be. So what I'd like to do now then um, is pass back to Stephanie, who I think is going to in, 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 um, introduce our keynote speaker, Camille. Thank you, Clive.